Welcome, everyone. I would like to thank the organizing committee for asking me to speak here today about some of my passions over the last decade. When we take a look at the word transformation, we see it in our literature all the time, especially recently. Everyone's talking about transforming learning, about transformation. But what does this actually mean? When you think about something that has transformed you, you normally think about something that changed the way that you think, changed the way that you act, or maybe changed the way that you feel about something. But truly, what is technology transformation? And that's what everyone's saying that we should work towards within our literature, within the field. I'm the director of the Learning Technologies Media Lab at the University of Minnesota, and day in and day out, I'm trying to figure out how it is that we can achieve the, this technology transformation. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, nine and a half principles. And yes, that half principle is the most important. I'm going to do it through the lenses really quickly of four different projects, two projects and actually two pieces of software that <clears throat> I've worked on at the University of Minnesota. That is the Go North Adventure Learning Series, Urtication, Geothetic, and Flipgrid. And guideline number one, design experiences and not products. I talk about this from the engagement, not completion. That is, we need to design learning environments that engage learners and not just a checklist of things that they are supposed to achieve. When we think about my work in adventure learning, I travel around the world. Before I do that, I write a curriculum about what I want students to achieve. And it doesn't have to be me going to remote places. It can be in a pre-service teacher education program or can it be in a business class. And here's a little introduction to the work that I do. Understand our impact on the actual world. You have to experience it firsthand. So, this, this is my classroom. Students from around the world join our team online as we research climate change in the Arctic. Together, we learn about our environment and how our actions can make a difference. So, the search continues. So we design a learning environment prior to going to a certain location, and that was first the idea of creativity like we heard about in the beginning, is that I was a K-12 educator at that point. I wanted to change the way that I was teaching in the classroom. I was using a 10-year-old textbook that wasn't motivating my students. So in 2004, I decided to take a dog sled trip. I led a team of six, for six months across the Canadian Arctic. And as we did that, we educated students about what we were doing through satellite internet, and they used a curriculum that we wrote. And we educated, at that point, over 3 million students. It was a complete surprise. And then at that point, I said, you know what, let's do the entire circumpolar Arctic. So in 2006, in 2007, we did Russia. In 2008, Fennoscandia, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. In 2009, back to Nunavut in Canada. And then in 2010, I crossed Greenland. And all of this came together to educate millions of students about climate change, about the changing environment through an online education program. And it also gave birth to my next project, which is Urtication. Urtication is where we are actually literally traveling to seven, all seven continents, and we're doing interviews to, uh, for people about education and sustainability. That is, how is one influencing the other? And that's what I found in a lot of my work, is that education is completely related to sustainability. To date, we have accomplished these uh, four different uh, continents. We just finished South America, and now we're off to finish the last ones here um, over the next two years, finishing in Antarctica. And as we traveled across these different uh, continents and interviewed the people from Gallowinkle, the Australian Aborigines of Australia to Africa, here's a little insight to what we have been collecting. In January of 2011, we traveled to Burkina Faso in Western Africa to explore the intersection of education and sustainability throughout this great region. As we traveled more than a thousand miles by car, donkey, camel, and motorcycle, we collected over 35 interviews with the Burkina Bay, including kings, elders, families, government officials, teachers, and students. Why 
In addition, we documented the collection of extraordinary sustainability areas, including individual admission to protect the land from deforestation. These are in some areas of Canada that are doing things that are wrong. There is a lot of organizations that we go back and we fail. A shame about the factories run by widowed women and pay for the children's education. Ultimately, what we learned from Virginia Bay is the importance of health, water, family, and accessibility to education. Means that are threaded throughout our history. And obviously, I can't dance. Um, but what we see here was this connection between education and sustainability. I saw that in the Arctic for 10 years traveling throughout this, this region. We see it in Africa. And then that gave birth to yet another project where I wanted students in the, in the Arctic, in the circumpolar Arctic, to collect their own knowledge, their own elders' traditional ecological knowledge that's passed on from generation to generation. So I have students in the Arctic, not my students, but the students of the Arctic collecting this knowledge. And actually just two weeks ago, uh, some of my PhD students returned from the Alaskan Arctic, from Kohatak, uh, and collected a little insight here. My name is, uh, my name is Jerry Lee Goodman, Jr. My name is Jerry Lee Goodman, Jr. I was born uh, just a couple miles from Kohatak, New Year. Uh, I grew up here. You always have to love a polar bear in the back. Um, so Willie talked about how his life is changing. His life is changing with the environment. And so all these projects came together to document the intersection of education and sustainability as students from around the world joined us and learned with us in an online learning environment. And that gave birth to the next project. And this is Geothenic. Geothenic is actually where students are learning how to do analysis as a geographer using geospatial technologies. It's based on TPAC, which I'll talk about in a second. It's based on creating a video in the very beginning to motivate those learners about what they need to solve. So for example, in this next video, you'll see that we're saying, students, you need to solve the problem of where to build the best hospital in San Francisco, looking at different layers of data. So within that environment, students are actually watching this video, getting motivated about what they need to solve using a geographic information system. And that leads me to guideline number two, the idea of trust. Commitment through experience and attitude. When you think about what it used to be like walking into a classroom, in a face-to-face -face classroom, the first thing you see is the instructor, the second thing is the content, and the third thing is the design of the environment. Think about how that has completely changed today. Now what the first thing you see is the design of the learning environment, just like we saw here in the video in the beginning, and then the content, and then lastly the instructor and how they're going to deliver that. An example of that is Flipgrid, where we are actually documenting and giving students the opportunity to interact with each other. Instead of having bulletin boards, they're actually capturing these videos of themselves based on a question that an instructor has posed. We just actually developed this at the University of Minnesota, my colleague, Dr. Miller, and it's just gone crazy with uh, people using this in the classroom rather than just having a discussion board response. Guideline number three, learners as designers. You know, we've been talking about this for years, the idea of the constructivist approach to learning, but how is it that we can actually integrate it in the classroom? The classic is the Oregon Trail. I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, some of you might, but it's where we actually could give input in the very beginning on what was going to happen to these explorers as they cross this region. When we look at the Go North project, that's where I traveled around the Arctic, I had students even back in the early 2000s documenting their story and uploading it to the online learning environment. They were capturing their knowledge. So here these students were collecting, documenting their work, 
uploading it to the learning environment in the early 2000s when it wasn't that easy as it is today. The North of 60 project that I just shared with you, we have students collecting the knowledge of the elders. This was actually just documented two weeks ago where they were going out on the land on their field trip that is going onto the ice to do ice drilling. In geothetic, remember they're doing analysis of geographic information systems. And here this individual found where the best place to build a hospital was in San Francisco. So just think about that. I worked for the National Geographic Society for many years, and we put millions of dollars into educating teachers about how they can get their students to do geography analysis within GIS. And we provided this online learning environment so students are actually identifying through this analysis where the best place is to build a new hospital in Valencia, in San Francisco, based on just what a geographer would do. Guideline number four, learners as experts. Experts by experience. Everyone talks about tapping that prior knowledge of the learner prior to um, starting a class. We know that it's very hard to do that. In 2006, when we did our study of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in the Alaskan Arctic, when I was up there, the teacher said to me, you know, you're teaching about this region, and you know who the experts are? The experts are my students. And so they actually were the first group ever to create a blog coming out of the Arctic about what it's like to live in this whaling community um, in, of Kaktovik on the northeast side of Alaska. And I thought, that's what we need to do whenever we can bring that knowledge into our classroom. Guideline number five. This is something that, again, people have been talking about, but have we had innovation around this or creativity around the idea of how we can collaborate within a classroom and have discourse? Well, again, this was a challenge that I was giving my team at the, at the Media Lab that we were working on, and so we invented this. This is called the Enviro Network. The idea behind Earth Education, Go North, these projects were to document students' experiences around the world. I also wanted to have that opportunity for my father, who's a farmer in southern Minnesota, who's at 73 years old, still working the land to share about his life, about education and sustainability. So we, we put this together in order that anyone can share their experience in an online and learning environment, just like you. And this is actually Charlie, who's an Inuit elder from Pegnerton in, the, in Nunavut in the Arctic. That also led to the birth of Flipgrid, which I just mentioned to you earlier. So you can actually go into Flipgrid, you can pose a question to your students, and what your students do is they give quick 30 second responses to that question that you pose to them. And pretty soon you have this tile of individuals that you can click on and interact with. Um, much easier, and the students love it much more than just dialogue within a discussion board. Guideline number six, aesthetics. There's not too many people talking about aesthetics. Donald Norman did, a few others. My colleague does a great job with that. But what does that mean within the design of a learning environment? You think about all the different learning environments out there. Why is it that they're going to come to your learning environment and want to return to it? Well, it's not only the utility of it, but it's also the aesthetics of it. That is, how does it make that individual feel when they come within that environment? Do they want to stay there? Do they want to return to it? And so we want this to be happening in the classroom. We want our students to be excited about it. And thus we design these learning environments to hopefully <laughs> really motivate those learners. And so the idea of us just finishing an environment and being done with it is never that approach. It's this constant iteration of design as we go through it. Guideline number seven, the self-narrative. Referencing of the experience. Think about what it's like when you go and have just an amazing night, whatever it is that you experience. The first thing you probably do is you pick up the phone or you, you text your, your best friend. You say, wow, I have to tell you about the night that I had in Valencia, right? You're referencing that experience. And that's what we want our students to be able to do within the environments that we create. We want them to go home and share with their parents, go home and share with their friends about what their experience was about. In 2004, as we were traveling across the Canadian Arctic, six months by dog sled, we had what was called timber tails. Okay? Timber tails, 
it sounds really childish, but it was actually what was happening on the trail from the perspective of a dog. Well, we quickly came to find out that it was the most visited place of the learning environment. We had literally millions of students going to this, and they loved it. It was from the perspective of our dog, Timber. Well, fast forward six months later, we arrived in the Minneapolis airport. We're coming down the escalator. We had no idea. I looked like hell six months from the Arctic. And there were hundreds of students there waiting to uh, welcome us back from this expedition of which they were part of this education program. And one thing we quickly came to find out was that Timber had now been running for president because the students absolutely loved it. They were referencing that experience. And Timber was a Democrat, by the way, in that, from, from, from the, in the United States perspective. And so that was pretty exciting for us. So we always think about how we're going to design this learning environment so that students will talk about it and they become part of their narrative. Guideline number eight, TPAC. You may have read a little bit about this. Mission and Kohler started out of Michigan State. I've been doing a lot of work around this. But again, if you're not familiar with it, you know, it started with the work of Shulman with the idea of what teachers need to know in order to integrate technology and pedagogy and content in the classroom to be a good teacher. And we used to say, you want to be right here. We then moved it forward and we said that we want teachers to be at the center of this key pack of technology, pedagogy, and content. But again, I would argue, and I gave the task to my team, I said, you know what, we need to do something with this. And so within Geothenic, remember I sh shared this with you earlier, you will see on the very bottom here that there are tabs for technology, pedagogy, and content. So if you are a teacher, you have no idea how to teach GIS in the classroom, a geographic information system, you can hit on those tabs and it will give you that knowledge within those three domains in order to help you teach it within your classroom. The next thing that we're doing is we're creating apps like this. This one will be launched uh, earlier this spring where actually a teacher can go and you can actually use it with pre-service teachers or in-service teachers. And what you're able to do is document your TPAC, your knowledge, where you are, reflect on it, see how that experience has changed over the education that you are receiving. And thus, you'll see that you're actually able to document and see the knowledge that you have. That is, that you could be in the center, but if you do not have the context to support your teaching in the classroom, that's the knowledge that you use. We're, so we're developing apps, be it on the iPhone and the iPad, in order that you can actually use it in the classroom. And that leads me to guideline, whoops, that leads me to guideline number nine. Innovative pedagogy. Again, this isn't rocket science, but we have to rethink the way that we're doing things. But I, th I would say that people are not many times because we are allowing things like Blackboard and Moodle, desire to learn, whatever it is to document our pedagogy and to put it into this container. This is simply a screenshot of an uh, online course that I'm teaching right now and I'm using Ning environment, and I simply am using videos all the time in order to motivate those learners and to show them what they need to do. I have a welcome video every day. There I am in my kitchen, um, just outside of Minneapolis, talking to my students. But how can we put this pedagogy in our environments in order to motivate them? That also leads to Adventure Learning 2.0. Remember, I was doing all this work around the, uh, the world, and there's some criticisms of that. Not everyone is going to have money to go around the world to innovate and to educate these students. And I said, I completely agree with that. So I wanted to put adventure learning in the hands of the students, your students. And so literally, this, these principles of what I wanted to accomplish are now in this environment, which is called the We Explore environment. So now your students can actually go out, do research, document with their iPad, all their, their research, and they are actually putting together their own expeditions from around the world. And I'm really excited to share that that is going to be uh, launching this spring, which I will uh, share with you where you can get that. Think about these different quotes. The motion picture is designed to revolutionize our education system, and that in a few years, it will supplant largely, if not entirely, the use of textbooks. The computer is a catalyst of deep and radical change in the educational system. Education over the internet is going to be so big, it is going to make email usage look like a rounding error. Has that happened? I would argue no, it has not happened. It's ultimately going to come down to you, 
the individual who's designing the learning environments to make a difference. And that's that half. What I say to my students when we're talking about design and learning and, and pedagogy and, and innovation and aesthetics, I ask them, are you going to actually want to be sitting on the other end of this learning environment and learning from that? If you don't think you're going to be motivated, then don't go out there and give it to somebody else. So let's review. This is your test for later on. Design experiences, not products. Build trust within your environment. Make your learners designers. Make, tap that expertise of your learners. Build collaboration and discourse. Think about aesthetics. Think about that self-narrative that is going to be designed over your learning environment. How are you going to build TPAC in order to support the teachers integrating within their classroom? How are you going to have innovative pedagogy? And lastly, what are you going to do as a learner? That leads me to one of the things I always like to end a talk on. People ask about, you know, you literally have traveled around the world for the last 10 years. What's your favorite thing? Well, I've just taken some of my favorite images that I'd like to share with you right now. So if we're in the Arctic, or this was just taken a couple of months ago when I was in the Atacama Desert, I want to end with one story. In 2004, when I was traveling across the Canadian Arctic, we actually hadn't seen anyone for over 73 days. And we were approaching the community of Baker Lake, Nunavut. And Nunavut is the newest territory in Canada. It's three sides of the size of Texas with only 73 miles of roads and none of them are interconnected. I would say that uh, I always want to be a, ca a Canadian, although I'm Minnesotan, but I'm, we're close. And as we're traveling there, over the horizon comes a snow machine. And you always are very excited when a snow machine is approaching because number one, you have a trail. Number two, you know you're getting close to the community. I stopped the team of dogs and I, I skied out to the elder and I said to the individual, I said, I said, I, I, I'm so excited to meet you. My name is Aaron Deering. And he looked at me, he got off the snow machine, he said, I know who you are, I recognize your voice from the internet. And this is in 2004, and that's when we didn't know if this approach was going to work to engage learners, but what we quickly came to find out when we got into these communities was that they were using the education program because it was reinforcing their own culture. And that's what I wanted to achieve, and I wanted them to interact with students literally from around the world. So finally, I showed you a bunch of different learning environments. I showed you different projects. I uh, welcome you to go ahead and to, to, to uh, Chasing Seals. I've chased a lot of seals in my life, uh, chasingseals.com. And there, I just want to let you know that these projects are free to use. Um, and so you can use them within your environments. And they will have a link to the different projects or send me an email. And the team at the Learning Technologies Media Lab will be uh, more than happy to uh, get you involved with it. So the last uh, 
suggestion is for you to go out and see how you're going to be innovative, have the creativity that we talked about earlier. And again, thank you very much.